This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. People often think of the brain as being like a computer. But according to my guest, neuroscientist Dean Burnett, that's only true if you imagine a computer that decided some information in its memory was more important than other information for reasons that were never made clear. Or a computer that filed information in a manner that didn't make any logical sense. Or a computer that kept opening your more personal and embarrassing files without being asked. Burnett is the author of the new book, Idiot Brain, What Your Head is Really Up To. It focuses on some of the more illogical behaviors the brain produces. He lives in Wales, where he's based at Cardiff University's Center for Medical Education and teaches in the psychiatry department. He writes the science blog, Brain Flapping, for the British newspaper, The Guardian. Dean Burnett, welcome to Fresh Air. Thank you for having me. So in that analogy that you make between the brain and a computer, you say your brain would be like a computer that decided it didn't really like the information you'd stored, so the computer altered it for you to, 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 to suit your purposes, to suit your preferences. And you say your memory is egotistical, that the brain tweaks and adjusts the information it stores to make you look better. What's an example of what you mean there? Well, I think the classic example you see is like someone claiming they caught a fish this big, holding their arms out. And uh, oh, the obvious joke is that they didn't really. That's actually you know, just an exaggeration. But a lot of people think that's just someone lying to try and look better. But a lot of research suggests that we actually, whenever we remember something, we will tend to embellish, the, you know, if we're telling someone about it, we'll embellish it slightly to make us look a bit better or we'll make it a bit more impressive as a story. But every time you do that you know, in the memory itself uh, is you know, it's got a good chance of it itself being edited it's been adjusted so the actual underlying memory is replaced by this updated version that you have created to to convey sort of uh, something which makes you look better and that seems to be happening constantly in that we think back on things and we sort of uh, uh, interpret them in different ways to make us feel better about ourselves make us feel more accomplished more involved more capable and more important than than we actually were uh, because you know, our memory is the only record of it that often goes unnoticed. In writing about memory, you write about the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. And short-term memory really doesn't hold very much. I mean, from how you describe it, it holds less than I even thought. Yeah, that's, that's a sort of a, one of those mainstream ideas of how memory is structured and works, which is not quite correct in that short-term memory you see a lot of films and like TV shows, they sort of portray short-term memory as something from an hour ago or like that same day. Uh, whereas actually short-term memory is 30 seconds to a minute. Anything longer than that tends to actually now be officially a long-term memory because it takes the brain... Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Anything longer than a minute is officially long-term memory? Essentially, yes. That means my long-term memory is worse than I thought. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange... Because um, short-term memory is essentially patterns of activity in places like the frontal cortex. It's like and it's like a firework display, or like I liken it to writing your like writing a shopping list in the foam on your coffee. You can sort of do it and it's something it'll stay legible for a minute, but just generally quickly it'll fade away. Whereas a long term memory actually is like the neurons and the brain cells connecting together to form a new memory. But that takes time. That takes like thirty seconds to a minute for that to actually be achieved and the storage to actually happen. So in the interim, we have this short-term memory, which is sort of holding a pattern just in place, waiting for either the memory to be formed or for the information to be replaced. And you can you obviously know that happens a lot because when you sort of get up to go to the kitchen to get something, and then when you get there, you think, why, why am I in here now? And then you've, you, know, you've, you can't remember why you came in in the first place. All you know is that you're there now. And that's like an example of a short-term memory being sort of lost rather than it's stored, uh, despite the fact that you actually have acted on it already. So I found this very interesting. You say in your book that there's evidence to suggest that nearly everything we experience is stored in long-term memory in some form. Hmm. And here's why I find that interesting. This is the kind of thing that happens to me a lot. Like one of our producers will come up to me and say, do you know that blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say in all honesty, that sounds familiar. I don't know if I know that. (laughs) <laughs> and, yeah. and as my producer starts explaining, I slowly start to remember that, yeah, I did know that. And I realized that I once knew this thing, then I'd forgotten it. But there's still some kind of vague imprint of that memory in my mind. And the more I hear about it, the more the memory starts to resurface. Is mm. that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's, um, that's, a, that's a quite a, 
there's a lot of evidence to suggest, suggest that there is different types of memories, something called familiarity and the difference between that and recall. Because with, with uh, familiarity, it's like you say, you know you know something, but you don't have any more information than that. All you know is that this has been encountered previously. Yes. Yeah. So yes. again, like using, using <laughs> the computer analogy, if you do a Google search and then some things pop up and some of them are like already purple, it's, oh, I've been to that site before. You don't know what that site has on it. You don't know what it was for. It could be something dodgy. Maybe you were drunk at the time. I don't know. But you just know that you've been there before. Uh, but it's when you actually open like the, the, the file or open the store that you actually understand what's going on in there. So it's the same with like the, the the name thing again, or like when you meet someone and they have a very familiar face. You think I I know this person. I know why do I know them? And then they'll tell you some details, and they'll fill in a few, you know, say a few more things, and they'll say something. Would you go? Oh yes, that that's why. Because at that point, there's um, enough familiarities occurred. It's sort of reached the threshold, the recall threshold, where it's not just knowing that you have the memory. Now the memory itself is actually activated. And it all comes flooding back. It's that very strange sensation of like, oh yes, and I remember all that. And it all look, the actual memory itself is triggered because uh, uh, enough familiarity has you know, uh, happened. So the activity leading to that memory has gone past a certain point, and the whole thing is set off. And we have like the vivid experience just coming back to you, going, oh yes, and I met him here, and then we did that, and that was ten years ago, and and so on, so on, so on. So there are lots of, you know, the brain has a good sort of rule of thumb for new and old. Like that's that's a new thing, that's an old thing, that's a new thing, that's an old thing. But when you actually need the, the detailed information itself, that's when you need to trigger the recall threshold, for want of a better description. Okay, so, so the downside for me is I have a lot of memories that I will only remember if somebody tells me that mm. information again, and then it will start to surface. So on the downside, I've forgotten that memory. But on the positive side, once I hear it the second time, I think I'm more likely to remember it and keep it as a more permanent memory. Am mm. I deluding myself or is that neurologically probable? No, that's, that makes perfect sense because we, we remember certain things and not other things. And that's sort of a constant problem because we'd like to remember the things like, for, like if you're revising for a test or an exam, that's the stuff you want to remember. But abstract information which is just like intangible data. And that isn't something the brain has really evolved to process. It can do it, but it's not its, it's, not its preferred form of information. It's more about experiences and things with like with a strong emotional attachment. Any, any emotionally vivid memories, like your first bike, the, you know, your first date with your partner, your, your wedding date, these are all things which have strong emotional resonance. So they have a lot more attachments in the brain, like every single memory has lots of different links to it. So there, there are lots of different ways to trigger it. So if you have like an old memory which you don't actually have any really thought about, that's fair enough. It's got, it's got a limited amount of connections to to make it accessible. But then when you are you know, reminded of it, we're talking to a person, and you go, "Oh yes," and then it all comes flooding back. That that that's a new sensation. That's uh, now now you associate that memory with this experience of not being able to remember something, and then remembering the person, then being happy that you remember them. So you're you're forming lots of new connections to it. So that actually does make perfect sense in that the act of having a sudden vivid recollection would in would in, in fact increase the likelihood that the memory will be a bit more uh, a bit more resilient from then on. So it's summertime, which means a lot of people are going on vacation, and a lot of those vacationers are going to be driving many of them with children in the car. And I think children are especially prone to motion sickness. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a very interesting explanation for why we can get motion sickness in a moving vehicle. Yes, it's one of those things which people, oh, it's such a common thing. I think a lot of people don't give it that much thought. But when you think about it, moving shouldn't make us sick. We move around all the time. We're a very mobile species. So why no, why would moving suddenly make us want to throw up? And one theory is, perhaps the most salient theory at the moment, is that it's caused by a sensory confusion in the brain, in that when you're walking, uh, you know, like as humans tend to do a lot, there's a lot of distinct signals being relayed to the brain, like in the area, like, like, like the thalamus, where all the sensory information is put together and sort of you know, fed to the other parts of the brain. So when you're walking, you've got the sort of the left, right, up, down sort of sensation. You've got the muscular system doing its doing its thing and relaying all the signals to the brain. And you've also got the balance sensors in your ears, like little little tiny little tubes full of fluid. And the motion of that fluid tells us where where we're going. So like if we're upside down, we can tell, and if we're going fast, we can tell because this fluid just obeys the laws of physics. And also you've got your eyes, and the world's going past at a certain rate. 
all these things are sensory information which is fed into the like the thalamus area which is which, which integrates all this sensory information together to give us an opinion or give us a view of what's happening in the world around us so we think oh well i'm moving this is good that's, that's what i should be doing excellent all is well when you're in a vehicle and vehicles aren't something we've really evolved to deal with because obviously they're a very very recent addition to the world and evolution takes a long time to catch up with anything so when you're in a vehicle like a car or a train or a ship especially you're not actually physically moving your body is still you're sat down like so you've got no signals from the muscles saying we are moving right now the muscles are saying we are, we are stationary and also your eyes if you're sitting in a ship like you're, you're looking at a static environment so there's no information for the eyes to say we are moving it's just no oh, everything is still but the fluids in your ears they obey the laws of physics and they are sort of rocking around and sloshing because you are actually moving so what's happening there is the brain's getting mixed messages it's getting signals from the muscles and the eyes saying we are still and signals from the balance sensors saying we're in motion and these both of these cannot be correct there's a sensory mismatch there and in evolutionary terms the only thing that can cause a sensory mismatch like that is a neurotoxin or poison so the brain thinks essentially it's been poisoned when it's been poisoned the first thing it does is get rid of the poison aka throwing up and as a result so like as soon as the brain gets confused by anything like that it says oh well i don't know what to do so just just be sick just just in case and as a result we get motion sickness because the brain's constantly worried about being poisoned Oh, that is so, so incredibly not helpful. Not your explanation, but <laughs> the sickness. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's so, inconvenient, to say the least. So um, I think it's true that um, you're more likely to get motion sickness if you're reading in a moving vehicle, not not an airplane. This is what I found to be true, just that queasy feeling. Hmm. It, uh, I, I know like when I was growing up, I could not read in a car, I could not read in a bus, but I could read in a train and I could read in a plane. That's not like a, is that a Dr. Zeus poem? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> could you, could you on a plane? Could you, could you in a train? <laughs> no, so is, is there any, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a common experience and it's not just me, but perhaps mm. it's just me. Um, well, it makes, it makes, again, given the explanation I provide, that does make perfect sense because you are, it's not, it's not just you're, you're in the vehicle now. When you're reading a book, you are staring at something right in front of you. So you're shutting out a lot of the external visual information. Now, when you're in a car, you, you, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't get motion sickness because the brain can effectively integrate this. For some people, just are prone to it. It's just a, just a quirk of development. Uh, but you know, in your car, you can look out the window. You can see things going by. You can see the passage and movement itself. So that sort of balances uh, the system. The brain's going, oh, look, things moving. I must be moving. And then sort of calms down the, the sickness response. But when you're reading, you're looking at sort of a s- small static square. And you know, the, the external information which would say you're moving, that's shut out even more than it would otherwise be. And you're focused in straight ahead. And your vision's directed elsewhere. So it sort of increases the, the sensory mismatch, which is causing the sickness in the first place. Because you are sort of dead, you're looking at a fixed point. And you've got no visual information to try and help, you know, um, allay the brain's concerns. So, yeah, that, that, that would make perfect sense. So, uh, I think a lot of people outgrow motion sickness. And is that because your brain, over time, adjusts to the mixed message that it's getting when the vehicle is moving, but your body is staying still? That's probably what's happening, yeah. it's um, Children are ten- generally tend to be more prone to things like which, which are technically uh, the brain getting things wrong. Uh, things like sleepwalking. Children are far more prone to sleepwalking and things like that, and motion sickness. It's because their brains are still developing. They're still being shored up. They're still being refined. They're still forming all the connections they will need for the rest of their lives. And oh, this means the this, this systems aren't so efficient yet. So gradually, and over time, they will, you know, they'll sort of lose the excessive parts. They'll re- refine the more um, useful components. And as a result, like the more... Well, the less helpful uh, things the brain does will sort of be slowly fading away because the brain becomes a bit more focused and a bit more refined and efficient over time as uh, as we age. So um, how much is intelligence based on having a good memory? Like if you if you have a hard time remembering things you've learned, then you can't build on those things. You can't use those things to synthesize, you know, an analysis of... Mm of, of uh, you know, a, a text or politics or, or whatever. So um, are memory and intelligence intertwined and dependent on each other? 
Uh, yes, to a certain extent. Uh, a lot of uh, psychologists uh, that differentiate between two types of intelligence. There's crystallized intelligence, which is uh, which is like things you remember, things you've learned, and the information you have access to. So someone on a quiz show, for example, would be, you know, someone a champion of a quiz show, they would have very high crystallized intelligence because they can just remember all this information, all these facts, and recall them at a moment's notice uh, as and when they need to. So that's a very high crystallized intelligence. But that's not the only element of intelligence. also something we call fluid intelligence. And that's the ability to apply the information, the ability to work with it, the ability to process it. So if you see Sherlock Holmes, like he's presented with three different things, and he can go, ah, they put these things together, they show that the killer was there at midnight and he had a brown dog, and that's more like fluid intelligence because taking abstract information and processing it and working with it and applying it to the situation in front of you. So crystallized intelligence is like the information you have. Fluid intelligence would be your ability to use that information and extrapolate from it and to apply it in real-world situations. So the two are quite different in many ways. Like fluid intelligence, a lot of research suggests that declines as we get older, just because our brains just age and become slightly less efficient over time with just general wear and tear. Whereas crystallized intelligence doesn't seem to have any ceiling on it. It just keeps expanding as we get older, assuming, of course, our brains still keep working as they should and no neurodegeneration occurs. I thought it was the other way around, that your ability to synthesize things does not decrease with age, but your ability to just kind of like memorize things and retrieve facts does. Um, A lot of people sort of claim that, yes, but uh, a lot of the research suggests that it's actually the other way around in that you can, I think it's more a case of you you can't stop remembering things. Like you don't don't reach the age 65 and suddenly don't remember anything from that point on because obviously that's not what happens. Unless you have some sort of serious disorder, of course. But anyway, you can carry on building up information over time. You can, when you're eight years old, you remember what happened yesterday or the day before, and you remember where to go, and you remember your appointment. So you can still build on the crystallized intelligence. It's just that the the, the parts which process the information tend to get a bit rusty. So that, that according to the science, that's one that's one argument anyway. But uh, as as I say in the book a lot, with most neuroscience uh, claims and studies, you'll find another one which says the opposite pretty easily. Because it's a, it's a very confusing organ. Do you think of yourself as having a good memory? I think I would say that I do have a good memory, but uh, not for everything. Because like, the brain does seem to have a tendency to uh, specialise or to have preferences for the things it likes to remember and likes to process. Some people are better at maths, some people are better at music and things. Whereas I, you know, like I said, I have a good memory for episodes of The Simpsons or jokes that I've heard or people I've met recently and like anecdotes, but things like uh, household organization and bills to pay, I tend to have a rather poor memory for these things, as my wife will constantly tell me. So yeah, I have a good memory in some ways and not in others. So you write a a, a blog for The Guardian Mm -hmm. uh, called Brain Flapping. Yeah. What's the most commented on post that you've written? This... uh, well, it came as a surprise for the first time, but it shouldn't have in hindsight. I've written about a lot of things, like uh, trying to deal with some controversial subjects, like uh, transgender issues. That was quite a hot-button one, and immigration, whether it's good or bad, and same-sex marriage got a lot of responses. But the most controversial post I did, in terms of the most angry comments I got, was whether or not you should put milk in your tea before the water or after. <laughs> That is, such, that, is, that is the most British thing you'll ever hear, I know. But that is like, that was the most, even my parents got involved with that one, which they never normally do. So Wait, so what was your argument? Well, there's a study which says you should put milk in first, but that actually only applies to uh, if you use it from a teapot in a sort of bone china cup, because obviously it takes the heat off the tea so the cup doesn't fracture. But if you use a mug, then it's got a different process. And it went down into the chemistry of it. And it came down to the fact that you should put it first or last. It depends on how you like it, because it's all about taste perception and the ritual and the psychology behind it. But that uh, diplomatic cop-out wasn't enough for some people. They decided that uh, I should hear in no uncertain terms how wrong I was. So w- which do you do? Uh, me, I put uh, milk in second, actually. Uh, but I might actually be kicked out of the country for this, but I, I can't tell either way, and that's not something a British person wants to hear. But, uh, I, yes, I, I'm not actually fussed either way. I can take it both ways. Nice to know that tea is clickbait in <laughs> yes, English. <laughs> very much so. <laughs> Dean Burnett, thank you so much for talking with us. No problem at all. Thank you very much for having me, Terry.
Dean Burnett is the author of the book Idiot Brain, What Your Head is Really Up To. He writes the science blog Brain Flapping for the British newspaper The